All right. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, my name is Kendra Field, and on behalf of the Du Bois Freedom Center, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Chad Williams here to speak about his forthcoming book, The Wounded World, W.B. Du Bois and the First World War. Um, before we begin, I'll just mention that tonight's talk was made possible in part by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, Sustaining Humanities Through the American Rescue Plan in partnership with the American Historical Association. Um, the program will last for one hour, and following my uh, brief introduction, Dr. Williams will speak about the new book, and then we'll take lots of time for question and answer from the audience. Chad Williams is the Samuel J. and Augusta Spector Professor of History and African and African American Studies at Brandeis University. Dr. Williams earned a BA with honors in history and African American studies from UCLA and received both his MA and PhD in history from Princeton University. He specializes in African American and modern US history, African American military history, the World War I era, and African American intellectual history. His first book, Torchbearers of Democracy, African-American Soldiers in the World War I Era, was published in 2010 by the University of North Carolina Press. A landmark study, Torchbearers of Democracy, won the 2011 Liberty Legacy Foundation Award from the Organization of American Historians. It also won the 2011 Distinguished Book Award from the Society for Military History and was designated as a 2011 Choice Outstanding Economic Title. He is co-editor of Charleston Syllabus, Readings on Race, Racism, and Racial Violence, and Major Problems in African-American History. Dr. Williams has published articles and book reviews in numerous leading academic journals and collections, as well as op-eds and essays in The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Time, and The Conversation. He has earned fellowships from the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Schomburg Center for Research on Black Culture, the Ford Foundation, and the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. His next book, which is about to come out, The Wounded World, W.B. Du Bois and the First World War, will be published early April, April 4th to be exact, by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. It's available for pre-order now everywhere. Um, and it's uh, such a pleasure to, to call Dr. Williams a friend and a colleague and also an alumna, alumnus of the uh, Du Bois Forum, our inaugural forum from last year and a returning um, forum uh, participant this coming July. That's the Du Bois Forum of the Du Bois Freedom Center, which will take place this July, July 6 to 9, 2023 in the Berkshires. Thank you so much. All right, great. Thank you, Kendra, for that very generous uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Zoe, for all of your organizational uh, work and, and wizardry. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time to, to join us uh, this evening on the eve of W.B. Du Bois' uh, birthday. Um, definitely very timely. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here. All right, perfect. Um, yeah, so let's just get into it. This evening, I'm, I'm going to tell a story. It's a story about war, the challenges of being African-American. It's a story about race and democracy, about history and memory. It's a story about hope and disillusionment, faith and tragedy, determination and failure. It's a story that spans more than two decades, from one world war to the next and features as its central character, arguably the most significant black intellectual in American history. But before I get into the details of this story, let me take you back a moment to October of 2000. I had just started doing research for my dissertation on African American soldiers in World War I, which would become my first book, Torchbearers of Democracy. And at the time was visiting the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where the papers of Du Bois are housed. I had very responsibly uh, in advance gone through the finding aid and saw a curious reference to Du Bois' World War I materials. So I was intrigued, didn't really know what it was. I go to the library special collections desk, I ask the archivist to see this collection. I'm expecting maybe a few folders, maybe even a whole box if I'm lucky. Instead, the archivist returns with six 
microfilm reels. Okay, so what could this possibly be? So I load the first reel, I turn the machine, and I slowly forward the film to the first frame. And this is what I saw. What I was looking at was the table of contents for an unfinished and unpublished manuscript by Du Bois on the Black experience in World War I. This was followed by the actual manuscript itself, along with all of Du Bois's research materials and correspondence related to the project. So needless to say, I was shocked, thrilled, and completely overwhelmed. As I began to immerse myself in this archive and learn more about it, I realized that it was not completely unknown. I mean, after all, I was looking at a microfilm copy with the original materials actually located at Fisk University, as I'll later find out. Some Du Bois scholars, most notably David Levering Lewis, had mentioned it in their works. But most people, when I tell them about Du Bois's unpublished manuscript, they're just as surprised as I was that day in October of 2000. Now, why this is the case, given all that has been written about Du Bois, would be, I think, a really fascinating story to tell. Also, as you can probably imagine by just looking at this table of contents, the manuscript itself is truly fascinating. Piecing the manuscript together, analyzing it would make for another really amazing project. But what I'm really interested in is the story behind this book. What happened? Why did Du Bois write it? What was it about? Why did he spend so much time working on it? Why did it remain ultimately incomplete and unpublished? Why is it even important? So as best I can in about the next 25 minutes, half hour or so, let me tell you the story based on my forthcoming book of the Wounded World, W.E.B. Du Bois and the First World War. Now I'm assuming for this audience that Du Bois really needs no introduction. But I would just emphasize that during the years of the First World War, Du Bois was truly at the height of his influence and arguably the most widely recognized and respected spokesperson for African Americans. This was certainly reflected on the occasion of his 50th birthday, where he was feted and presented with a silver cup inscribed with the following message from the branches of the National Association for the Advancement of colored people to W.E. Burkhart Du Bois, writer, scholar, seer, on his 50th birthday, February 23rd, 1918, given an affectionate appreciation of his great gifts and gratitude for the consecration of these gifts to the service of his race. I think it's so important to keep in mind these last words, Du Bois's service to the race. Du Bois closely followed the World War from the opening guns of August of 1914. Yet in a very real sense, Africa is a prime cause of this terrible overturning of civilization which we have lived to see. He wrote in the landmark 1915 Atlantic Monthly article, The African Roots of War. He pinpointed the origins of the conflict and the competition amongst the European belligerents for imperial control of Africa and its people. France, England, and Belgium all had blood on their hands, but thirsty for global domination, Germany, in Du Bois' opinion, posed a grave threat to the world's darker races. The allies had to win. So when Woodrow Wilson addressed Congress on April 2nd, 1917, and declared war on Germany, Du Bois, setting aside his pacifist principles, was not opposed to the United States entering the conflict. He argued that it presented an opportunity for African Americans to state claim to their citizenship and bring meaning to Wilson's claim that the world must be made safe for democracy. Black people had fought in the past, and now they would do so again with hopes that the two warring ideals of being Black and being American that Du Bois famously articulated in The Souls of Black Folk would at last be reconciled. 
Du Bois threw himself into the war effort, encouraging African Americans as soldiers and civilians to demonstrate their loyalty on and off of the battlefield. But white supremacy tested his patriotism. Along with other African Americans, he had to reckon with moments like the unjust execution of 13 soldiers following a racial shootout in Houston, Texas, and especially the East St. Louis pogrom of July 1917, which left hundreds of Black people dead. While African Americans certainly pleaded for Wilson to make America safe for democracy, they also demanded it, as evidenced by the silent protest parade in response to the East St. Louis pogrom with Du Bois marching in the front next to James Weldon Johnson. So when Joel Spinger, former chairman of the NAACP and one of Du Bois's closest friends, approached him in early June of 1918 with an offer to become a captain, become a captain in the War Department's Military Intelligence Division, Du Bois had a momentous and potentially career-defining choice to make. He knew that disappointment would arouse suspicions, but he believed that in the letter he wrote to the director of the Military Intelligence Division, his decision to accept the offer reflected, in his words, no inconsistency with or change of attitude from my lifelong work and opinions. Indeed, he viewed his attitude as one of far-reaching patriotism. But just to make sure no lingering reservations existed about his loyalty, he wrote close ranks for the July issue of the crisis. The Great War represented the crisis of the world, Du Bois began. He argued that however distant the war seemed, Black people had, quote, no ordinary interest in the outcome. For this reason, African Americans had to make their allegiances clear. Let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances and close our ranks shoulder to shoulder with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy, Du Bois declared. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it gladly and willingly with our eyes lifted to the hills. Closed ranks unleashed a firestorm of criticism. The Boston civil rights activist and one-time ally, William Monroe Trotter, labeled Du Bois, among many other insults, a rank quitter of the fight for rights. From coast to coast, in newspapers and barbershops, many African-Americans branded Du Bois as self-serving at best, and at worst, a traitor to the race for a man who had committed his life to the cause of freedom and justice for Black people, service to his race, no charge could be more hurtful. The captaincy offer ultimately crumbled, but the uproar and damage to his radical credentials left Du Bois deeply wounded. Du Bois' attempt to strike a grand bargain with the federal government and American democracy seemed yet more misguided in light of the U.S. military's treatment of Black servicemen. Approximately 380,000 African American soldiers served in the racially segregated United States Army. The majority of Black troops served, uh, excuse me, the majority of Black troops in France unglamorously labored in the services of supply, loading and unloading ships, digging ditches, laying railroad tracks, burying dead bodies. The Army reluctantly agreed to the creation of two Black combat units, the 92nd Division, composed of draftees, and the 93rd Division, made up largely of Black National Guardsmen. While the 93rd Division compiled a stellar combat record, the 92nd Division became, as Du Bois later described it, quote, the storm center of the Negro troops. Racist white commanders and deliberate neglect from the War Department doomed the performance of the division from the start while as black officers. Du Bois' shining examples of talented 10th manhood and racial leadership endured humiliation after humiliation. African Americans could point to several notable battlefield triumphs and moments of racial pride. But for most black soldiers, the war for democracy that Du Bois had so enthusiastically championed devolved into a personal hell. As the end of the war neared, Du Bois, his credibility tattered, his leadership in question, 
sat in the most precarious position of his otherwise illustrious career. Then, quite unexpectedly, an opportunity presented itself, one that would profoundly impact Du Bois' life for the next two decades. At the October 1918 Board of Directors meeting, the NAACP proposed that Du Bois spearhead production of a book on the history of the Black experience in the war. He leapt at the opportunity. The scholar in Du Bois was intrigued, but more important, here was a chance for redemption. As a way of demonstrating his continued ability to organize and lead, he envisioned the book as a collaborative effort. He had two co-authors in mind. Carter G. Woodson, appropriate during Black History Month, founder of the Association for the Study of Negro Life in History, and a second potential co-author, Emmett J. Scott, former secretary to Booker T. Washington, who had recently served as a special assistant to the Secretary of War. But Du Bois's influence had its limits. Woodson, arguably the most prominent African-American historian in the nation, next to Du Bois, insisted on receiving sole credit for the project. Scott, arguably most influential African-American in the government during the war, had plans to write his own book. At stake was the right to call oneself the historian of the Black experience in the war and the leadership stature that went along with it. This was a fight that Du Bois had to win. Undaunted, he set his sights on France, where, as he would later write, the destinies of mankind center. On December the 1st, 1918, Du Bois departed from Hoboken, New Jersey, as part of the official press delegation accompanying President Woodrow Wilson to the peace conference at Versailles. Du Bois spent three months in France. He organized a landmark Pan-African Congress in February 1919. His principal mission, however, was to conduct research for the NAACP war history. He toured the battlefields. He saw the trenches where soldiers of the 92nd Division fought until the 11th hour on November the 11th before the armistice went into effect. He visited the encampments and experienced, as he recalled, a touch of war. Most important, he talked with black soldiers and officers. With military intelligence following his every move, Du Bois absorbed tale after tale of discrimination, slander, and abuse inflicted upon black servicemen at the hands of the American army. A longtime friend, Matthew Virgil Boutte, served as his guide. Boutte was a captain in the 92nd Division who had been constantly humiliated by his fellow white officers, court-martialed on false charges of inefficiency, seriously injured in combat, and placed despite his officer status in a segregated hospital ward with regular enlisted men. He entrusted his diary to Du Bois, where in one emotional entry, he scrawled, no nation on earth has ever hated a group as the Americans hate Negroes. Never in my life have I heard such an astounding series of stories, Du Bois wrote from France in a January 1919 letter to his NAACP colleagues. You have not the faintest conception of what these men have been through. It is not only astonishing, but it will arouse every ounce of sympathetic blood in your veins. He knew what needed to be done. I can solemnly and without hesitation, he declared, excuse me, I can say solemnly and without hesitation, the greatest and most pressing and most important work for the NAACP is the collection writing and publication of the history of the Negro troops in France. Du Bois returned to the United States enraged, embarrassed, and determined. He cannot help but to question if his decision to encourage Black people to throw body and soul into the war effort had been worthwhile. He channeled his frustrations and the anguish of African-American servicemen he encountered in France into the post-war issues of the crisis. In the May 1919 issue, he informed readers about his mission in France, exposed the racism of the US Army and defended the honor of black troops. The highlight of the issue was returning soldiers. 
as his words would serve as a rallying cry for African Americans in the aftermath of the war. We return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. History would be Du Bois' central battlefront in the struggle over the historical meaning of the war. Most African Americans through most American Negroes do not realize that the imperative duty of the moment is to fix in history the status of our Negro troops. He wrote in the editorial announcing his plans to reduce the study of the black experience in the war. To assist in this cause, he tasked readers of the crisis and black soldiers in particular to quote, help in the compilation of this history, letters, Diaries, photographs, official military documents, and personal memoirs quickly flooded Du Bois' office. Du Bois promised that his book, which he tentatively titled The Negro in the Revolution of the 20th Century, would appear by the fall. Black veterans hoped that Du Bois would tell their story, and Du Bois intended to serve as their voice. Generating further excitement, Du Bois published an essay for the history of the Black man in the Great War in the June 1919 issue of The Crisis, a tantalizing preview of the larger book he planned to write. He wrote, quote, there is not a black soldier, but who is glad he went, glad to fight for France, the only real white democracy, glad to have a new clear vision of the real inner spirit of American prejudice. The day of camouflage is past. Du Bois' certainty would be severely tested throughout the summer of 1919. From Washington, D.C. to Chicago to Phillips County, Arkansas, race riots and full-scale massacres exploded throughout the country. The number of lynchings skyrocketed. Black veterans found themselves quite literally fighting for their lives. James Weldon Johnson labeled these bloody months the Red Summer. The horror of the summer was seared into Du Bois' memory as he would remember 1919 as a year in his words of extraordinary and unexpected reaction. Du Bois used his 1920 book, Dark Water, to reflect on the war, its appalling aftermath, and his growing disillusionment. He minced no words. In the chapter titled The Souls of White Folk, Du Bois wrote, let me say this again and emphasize it and leave no room for mistaken meaning. The World War was primarily the jealous and avarice struggle for the largest share in exploiting darker races. Du Bois also asked a remarkable question. How great a failure and a failure in what does the World War betoken? On both a personal and intellectual level, this was a question that he had to answer. Du Bois therefore committed himself to the NAACP war project. He devoted significant time throughout much of 1920 and into 1922, often writing late into the night past his usual bedtime of 10 p.m., to drafting several potential chapters for what he confidently believed would be the definitive history of the Black experience in the war. Still exhilarated from his Pan-African Congresses in 1919 and again in 1921, he wrote chapters on the experiences of Black troops in the French and British armies, as well as a chapter thinking about the future of the Black world in the wake of the war. Du Bois's early chapter drafts also reflected an attempt to try and find redemptive value in the global catastrophe and his place in it. This was clear in a chapter that he titled very provocatively, The Challenge, which summarized the difficult choices that African-Americans and himself faced in supporting the war. For a moment, and it was but a moment, it passed, but for a moment, the country seemed to rise to its mightiest stature, he wrote. Addressing his disillusionment, he reflected, I have been called bitter. I am bitter, but here I saw the hurts, the tears, the pain, as in one country, and that country was mine. Du Bois was glad that at least for this one brief, fleeting, emancipatory moment, he could call himself an American, that he and the race could think with the nation and not as a mere group. We could rise to mighty selfishness, the nation, our country, the allies as champions of the little hurt folk, democracy. The only way he could explain his delusion was insanity. We were mad and let us not 
excuse me, we, this is the only word for it. We were mad and let it not excuse us to say that the madness was divine. But he still refused to completely admit that he was wrong. How in the end did all this set with our inner problem? He pondered, after all, it was not a mere bargain. It was a moving wish. Du Bois pressed ahead to finish his book. He held out hope that despite a lack of financial support and numerous other commitments and distractions that it would still soon be completed. But the worsening conditions facing African-Americans and other peoples of African descent throughout the diaspora caused him to further struggle with the war's individual and collective meaning. The walls of caste segregation seemed to only grow higher. Racial violence became more and more horrific. The grip of Europe on Africa, in spite of his Pan-African Congresses, only tightened. And then there was also personal tragedy. In January of 1922, Du Bois lost arguably his closest Black friend and the man who best embodied the quest to reconcile race and country, Colonel Charles Young. Young was the highest ranking Black officer in the Army and Black America's military hero. He had been unjustly retired from active service during the war for dubious health reasons to prevent him from becoming a general. It broke his heart. The army reinstated him after the armistice and assigned him to Liberia, where he died in 1922. Over a year after his death, Young's body was finally returned to the United States and buried with full honors in Arlington National Cemetery. But Du Bois cannot forgive the government for what he described as an inexcusable crime of sending Young to Liberia. For Charles Young's blood pressure was too high for him to go to France, Du Bois wrote in an editorial, why was it not too high for him to be sent to the even more arduous duty in the swamps of West Africa? This ugly reminder of the war's legacy provided further validation for the new title Du Bois had given his book, The Black Man and the Wounded World. As the new title of his book reflected Du Bois' initial conceptualization of the war as a potentially revolutionary moment in the reconstruction of global race relations had evolved into an interpretation of the conflict as one of the darkest moments in world history. The war was a global tragedy. That along with laying the seeds of future war strengthened white supremacy and furthered the economic exploitation of peoples of African descent. No surprise then that he described the war in the opening chapter of his book as, quote, a scourge, an evil, a retrogression to barbarism, a waste, a wholesale murder. Du Bois's public announcement in 1924 of The Black Man and the Wounded World sparked renewed public interest in the book. Encouraged, he began writing. By 1926, he had drafted the bulk of his envisioned chapters the book finally seemed on the verge of completion. But he felt that he needed assistance. He had a massive manuscript that judged by his high scholarly standards and artistic expectations still required significant work. So he wrote to nearly, major, nearly every major foundation, philanthropic organization, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Carnegie Endowment seeking assistance and financial support all of these organizations expressed courtesy interests, but ultimately offered their regrets. But beyond the practical financial uh, aspects of the project, Du Bois faced an even bigger challenge, which was himself. The guilt about supporting the war ate away at him. This was reflected in a letter that he wrote to the news magazine, The World Tomorrow in 1930. He was approached to get his opinions on the war guilt debate, if Germany was solely responsible for the war and if American uh, intervention was justified. In his reply to the editor, Du Bois admitted in his words to being swept off my feet during the World War by the emotional response of America to what seemed to be a great call to duty. He continued, instead of a war to end war, or a war to save democracy, we found ourselves during and after the war descending to the meanest and most sordid 
of selfish actions. And we find ourselves today nearer moral bankruptcy than we were in 1914. Then very surprisingly, he admitted, I'm ashamed of my lack of foresight. And yet war is so tremendous and terrible a thing that only those who actually experience it can know its real meaning. Du Bois continued to forge ahead. Never content to remain unproductive, he turned to other projects, most notably his massive history, Black Reconstruction in America. The war, however, stayed on his mind. In a letter to Alfred Harcourt proposing Black Reconstruction in 1931, Du Bois informed the editor, quote, I'm going to add next year as a second volume, The Black Man and the Wounded World. That is the part which Negro troops in the World War and its significance for the world today. Harcourt responded to Du Bois that the proposed study on Reconstruction promises a really interesting book in his words, but he made no mention of the book on the World War. Du Bois managed to finish Black Reconstruction. Then he turned his attention again to the Black man and the wounded world. A trip around the world in 1936 brought even greater clarity to the book's new significance. Thanks to a fellowship from the Overlander Trust, Du Bois spent seven months abroad, first visiting Hitler's Germany, then China, and finally Imperial Japan. He returned to the United States in December of 1936, having seen firsthand the seeds of the next world war. The need for his book could not have been any more urgent. This, he believed, was the moment. He wanted people to see that the still open wounds from the last world war promised an even greater disaster in the near future. So in his mind, it was now or never. Hoping to finally put the project and the troubling memory of the war itself behind him, Du Bois reached out to the American Philosophical Society in March of 1937. I began my work in this field as a conventional study of the Negro as a soldier in the World War, he wrote. But over time, he explained, the whole theme has been expanding and developing in my mind, more especially since my trip around the world in 1936. He now conceived the book in his words, on a much broader and more important scale. If he could only have leisure and opportunity to finish this work, I think I can do something which will have influence on future knowledge with regard to war and colored people. He believed about $7,500 would be a sufficient amount. Not surprisingly, the American Philosophical Society denied his request. Du Bois received one final funding rejection in March of 1940 from the Social Science Research Council, just as Hitler prepared for the German army to invade France. Solution disheartened with a second world war, a tragic reality, Du Bois abandoned hope that he would finish and publish his book. Despite an investment of more than 20 years, despite a manuscript nearly 800 pages in length, the Black Man and the Wounded World, Du Bois's epic history of the Black experience in the First World War would never see the light of day. So this could very well be the end of this story, but we're left with the question of why. First and perhaps most glaringly, why didn't Du Bois finish The Black Man and the Wounded World? As I talk about in my forthcoming book, I think Du Bois suffered from what we might characterize as a form of intellectual shell shock when it came to writing about and rationalizing a war defined by its irrationality. In his semi-autobiographical 1940 book, Dusk of Dawn, Du Bois very tellingly wrote, in my effort to reconstruct in memory my thought and the fight of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People during the World War, I have difficulty in thinking clearly. Du Bois, difficulty in thinking clearly. He recalled that his time in France and the massive documents that he collected um, over the years still remained in his hands. They deserve publication, he wrote, not simply as a part of the Negro's history, but as an unforgettable lesson in the spiritual lesions of race conflict during a critical period in 
American history. By the 1940s, it was clear that the spiritual lesions caused by the First World War had not healed. World War II confirmed the failure of World War I, as well as Du Bois's decision, his failed decision, at the time to place his moral and political credibility on the line in encouraging African Americans to close ranks and support America and the Allies. The Du Bois' own wounds did not heal as well. In a letter to his alma mater, Fisk University, in 1941, when he was asked to consider the university's position on American preparedness into World War II, Du Bois wrote, I have lived through one period of deliberate and prolonged propaganda for war and partially succumbed to it until I really believed that the First World War was a war to end war and that the interests of colored people were bound up in the defeat of Germany. I live to know better and my opposition to war under any circumstances has been immeasurably increased. But even up to the final years of his life, Du Bois still sought to understand why he had supported the war in the first place. I felt for a moment as the war progressed that I could be without reservation a patriotic American, Du Bois wrote at the time in his 80s. I'm not sure that I was right, but certainly my intentions were. I did not believe in war, these are Du Bois's words, but I thought that in a fight with America against militarism and for democracy, we would be fighting for the emancipation of the Negro race with the armistice came disillusion. That disillusion stayed with Du Bois until his death on August 23rd, 1963 in Accra, Ghana. The war consumed Du Bois. It confounded him. He could not make sense of it as both a personal and historical moment. Indeed, he was unable to muster the intellectual focus and fortitude to complete his book. His failure embodied the tragedy and failure of the war he struggled so mightily to write about. In this sense, the Black man and the wounded world was Du Bois himself. But we're also left with the question of why does this story matter? Well, I believe it matters because Du Bois matters. He remains arguably the greatest black intellectual in this country. Just as we rightly celebrate his genius, we must also understand his humanity, someone who hoped and dreamed, someone capable of making the wrong decision, someone even capable of failure, but someone who changed. The failure of World War I and ultimately the failure to complete the black man in the wounded world were essential to Du Bois's political evolution and his radicalism. By the late 1940s, he became a staunch anti-war activist and in the eyes of the federal government, a threat. Du Bois was charged, indicted in 1951 by being on charges of being an agent to a foreign principal. He won acquittal, but the ordeal and the subsequent seizure of his passport by the government were painful reminders about the fragility of citizenship when it came to African Americans, especially those who criticized the government. In his 1952 book, In Battle for Peace, Du Bois wrote, as then, a citizen of the world as well as of the United States of America, I claim the right to know and think and tell the truth as I see it. I believe in socialism as well as democracy. Above all else, Du Bois wrote, I hate war. But I believe this story also goes beyond Du Bois. It reveals the impact of World War I on African-Americans, how it exposed the core tensions of African-American identity and how it shaped the history of racial struggle in the 20th century and up to the present. Indeed, many of the challenges that Du Bois faced during World War I and its aftermath are challenges that we are still living with today. Du Bois, through his life, through his work, through his voice, has tasked us with confronting the failures, the challenges of democracy, and continuing to work with all of our strength to heal, as he tried to do, our very wounded world. Thank you very much for your time. And Look forward to your questions that you may have. Turn things over to you. Thank Kimberly. you so much.
Um, thank you so much, Chad. That was that was really, really wonderful. Um, and I know we have some questions that will be coming into the chat. Please type your questions into the Q&A, sorry. Um, and to start us off, um, I will um, ask a couple of my own questions. Um, and I guess the first one, you know, thinking about your first book, um, um, Torchbearers leading into this book um, on Du Bois and the Wounded World. I'm, I'm curious about your own trajectory and journey into African-American military history in particular. Um, I also was thinking about this, Du Bois on this particular war, um, and then, you know, and then, you know, what I know a bit more about, which is his reflections on, of course, the Civil War era, um, and his reflections even on the American Revolutionary War and his own ancestors' involvement in that, and and so I was just I was kind of thinking about African American African American military history more broadly, um, your own journey into um, uh, this as one of the many fields in, in which you are expert, but also perhaps Du Bois is thinking more broadly beyond World War One. Yeah, um, kind of similar to Bois to, to Du Bois, I was really interested in the Civil War and Reconstruction era. Um, when I began my, my formal graduate studies and really saw kind of the need to think more critically about the World War I era and specifically the experiences of African-American soldiers uh, and veterans. Um, and I think you know, to your, your point, um, the story of, of Black freedom, the story of democracy um, has such an important thread through um, the military experiences of African-Americans going back to uh, the American Revolution and and up to the present, and Du Bois was was very much aware of that. Um, you know the, the the experiences of black soldiers really kind of come up in a number of of his books, um, especially uh, Black Reconstruction. Uh, so I think it was really important for me to to look at Du Bois's investment in in World War One, both as a political moment as a, as a uh, as a critical period where democracy itself uh, could be uh, reshaped, uh, but to also really take seriously Du Bois' historical interests in, uh, in, in the history of the war and how difficult it was for him to write about that history, uh, one that he was uh, so much a part of. Wonderful. Um, I guess, um... I also was struck by you had this um, really um, lovely attention to this 1919 trip um, when he's both, you know, interviewing soldiers and also, you know, organizing the Pan-African Congress. And, you know, the the fact that that trip was doing both of those things is just so, so, so fascinating. So I'd love if you could expand a little bit uh, more um, perhaps on that, on the relationship between uh, maybe in the course of that trip or more broadly between kind of his, you know, interest in Pan-Africanism and, and role in the Pan-African um, Congresses and um, and this work. Yeah, yeah it, it's really a, a fascinating story how Du Bois even gets to, to France in the first place. Um, so I won't give too much of that away. <laughs> it's it's in the book. Uh, but he manages to, to get to France uh, when many other African-Americans, including uh, William Monroe Trotter, at least initially, William Monroe Trotter found his own way to, to get to France, were denied passports. Um, but he had these kind of two intertwined objectives. You know, one was organizing the, the, the Pan-African Congress, and the other was working on this um, uh, book on, on the Black experience uh, in the war, um, and essentially conducting field uh, research, um, kind of ethnographic research, kind of in uh, the vein of um, uh, the Philadelphia Negro, really going around uh, the the different camps and talking directly to black soldiers and and officers, and getting you know kind of the firsthand on on the ground factual information uh, about their experiences. Um, so he really saw you know those, those two missions uh, as he characterized them as as intertwined, um, and I think his investment in uh, organizing the Pan African Congress was also. Uh, reflected in the Pan-African dimensions, uh, the diasporic dimensions of uh, his understanding of the war and how he uh, envisioned writing uh, the book of talking about the experiences um, of uh, African soldiers who had served in the French army, uh, Black soldiers who had served in the British uh, armies, um, really thinking about the ways in which the world was this you know, transformative moment 
uh, for uh, the entire African diaspora. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'm going to read a few different questions that came up in the chat, or we'll start with this one. Um, were other Black leaders openly speaking out against joining the war effort? And if so, what was their argument? Yeah, well, speaking out against the war was incredibly dangerous. Uh, the United States uh, government uh, was, was cracking down on all forms of, of su supposed sedition. Uh, the Alien Sedition Act. So this was a very repressive time. Um, uh, with that being said, you have African Americans like A. Philip Randolph, Chandler Owen, um, uh, William Monroe Trotter, uh, to an ex to an extent, you know, who are very critical um, of the federal government um, and who are making the argument that uh, we need to fight vigorously for our our civil rights. Uh, where as Du Bois is. Uh, ultimately calling for African Americans to, to close ranks. You know, they're saying that this is not the time for us to simply close ranks and forget our special grievances. This is the moment where we need to press our special grievances, um, you know, more, more forcefully, kind of anticipating uh, the uh, double V campaign uh, in World War II, uh, if you will. Uh, so you certainly have uh, some African Americans uh, who uh, speak out against uh, joining uh, the war effort. Uh, a. Philip Randolph is actually uh, arrested uh, and um, uh, and and tried. He's uh, later acquitted. Um, but I think it's important to remember that there was not uni unanimity in in thought. There were vigorous debates taking place amongst African Americans about what support for the war meant and ultimately, um, you know, what what patriotism uh, meant for for Black folks. Great. Um, next question. Why did Du Bois consider France to be the only true democracy? Yeah, I think Du Bois, like many other African Americans at the time, was kind of enraptured by France, uh, by uh, its image of racial egalitarianism, uh, which for anyone who has studied France's history knows that that was not true. Uh, France was uh, a colonial uh, nation uh, with a, a very troubling record uh, in terms of its treatment of uh, its uh, colonial subjects in Africa and, and elsewhere. Uh, but Du Bois was really kind of juxtaposing the way in which France uh, treated uh, African-American troops and other uh, Black people in France uh, at the time uh, versus the really horrific racism uh, that was taking place in the United States and in the United States Army. Um, it was really a, a, a case of the United States you know, uh, failing to live up to its democratic ideals and Du Bois kind of positing France as kind of this, this model of, of world uh, democracy. I think we can look at that very critically and kind of see kind of the naivete in, in Du Bois' um, understanding of, of France and its very kind of complicated and, and troubling you know, racial uh, history and, and its policies. Uh, but in the moment, uh, I think Du Bois was kind of so enraptured with this ideal of what democracy could potentially look like. Uh, he looked to France kind of as a different model of democracy than uh, the United States. Um, wonderful. We have a question about um, whether there was an element of naivete, of what, why it is that du, that du Bois might have been anticipated African Americans being treated differently in World War I. Um, and then another question, any reflections about the impact of the Black military bands and introduction of jazz in the French culture? Sure. I mean, and this was, you know, something I really struggled with. I mean, we can look back now and say, well, what was Du Bois thinking, <laughs> right? I mean, of course, African Americans weren't gonna be treated any differently uh, after the war. Uh, but I think it's important to, to really take his hopes seriously, uh, that he was kind of drawing on, as we discussed earlier, the historical traditions, the legacy of African Americans serving in the military, of using war as an opportunity to advance the cause of freedom and African American civil rights, especially during uh, the Civil War, um, and seeing the war as as this moment uh, where indeed democracy could potentially be expanded 
uh, to include African Americans and other peoples of African descent. I think it's important to really take Du Bois's investment in the ideal of democracy, thinking about Du Bois as a small d democratic thinker very seriously, um, and how he was hoping to, to, to really reconcile that double consciousness, which he talks about in the souls of Black folk. Um, you know, he, he reflects later that, you know, he felt closer to being an American during the war than at any other moment in, in his life. Uh, I think Du Bois was deeply invested in, in, uh, in the, the Americanness of, of what it meant to, to be African American. Um, and I think when, you know, we want to take that seriously, you know, not just to view him as kind of, uh, you know, naive and um, kind of blindly uh, misguided. Uh, with that being said, uh, Du Bois would really, you know, reflect in the subsequent years on kind of the, the errors of, of his thinking. And certainly by the 1940s and 1950s, he adopted a much more critical view of war itself, um, of democracy uh, itself. Right. So it's something that we want to keep in mind, Du Bois's growth and, and that uh, really remarkable kind of evolution in his, his thinking, specifically as related to, to war itself. Um, so I think the other question related to the, the Black military bans, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, a remarkable story. I actually spend quite a bit of time talking about them in, in my first book, Torchbearers of Democracy, the, the Harlem Hellfighters Band led by James Reese uh, Europe, as well as you know, a number of other Black uh, regimental bands who uh, were responsible for kind of ushering in the, the jazz craze uh, in France and introducing, um, you know, France to the, uh, the wonders of, of Black culture, you know, through, through ragtime and, and jazz. So certainly uh, an important part of the story. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Chad, I don't know if you know this, but, um, but Kari, my partner Kari and I co-teach a class on African-American expatriates in France for Tufts mm -hmm. um, in the summertime. And so we've used parts of your book on that. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, because yeah, I think James, James Reese, your Europe comes right through um, you know, where, where the class is taught. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think uh, I'm going to ask, ask one, one last question, if I may take the prerogative okay. here, about your research process and the archives. Um, because uh, uh, I know we've talked about the fact that, you know, these, some of these sources, many of these sources were at Fisk, um, yeah. not at UMass, where uh, Amherst, where many of um, his papers are. And I should say also that um, uh, Chad Williams will deliver the annual Du Bois lecture tomorrow at UMass Amherst for anyone that is interested in that. Um, or if someone is not here that you think would like to listen, have them have them zoom in. Um, but can, can you talk a little bit about about the sources for this book and the material and, and where and where and how you had to go uh, to gather it all. Yeah, so I initially encountered Du Bois's materials in microfilm form um, and then looked at the original materials which are housed in Fisk University. So it's an interesting story how this particular collection found its way to Fisk as opposed to the UMass uh, Amherst. But it's a it's a, a remarkable archive. It's just re really truly breathtaking to look at Du Bois's manuscript, which he worked on, as I said, for for nearly twenty years, to see the the pages, the the cutting and pasting that he did. You know, this this massive um, manuscript, some of the chapters, really kind of singing with with Du Bois's you know lyrical prose, others that are just kind of a jumble of notes. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, collection to get a sense of Du Bois as a historian kind of in progress, right? Um, but also as a historian who's really struggling to figure out what to do with all of this material. So there's the manuscript, which is, which is remarkable. Um, and then there's all of his research materials, you know, hundreds of, of letters and, uh, and, and, and diaries from soldiers themselves, from veterans who are writing to him telling him that this is what happened. Please tell, tell our story. Make sure you tell this history correctly. Um, military documents, photographs, beautiful photographs of, of soldiers. Um, you know, many of, many of them taken in, in portrait studios. Really another kind of piece of the story is how Du Bois collected all these materials and refused to return them <laughs> to some of the veterans who, who gave them to him when they asked for them back. So there, there's 
got a lot to, to say about the, the archive itself. Um, you know, certainly made use of the Du Bois uh, papers at UMass Amherst, which are now digitized, which it's just a, a wonderful, uh, you know, wonderful resource, um, wonderfully accessible. Um, so yeah, so really, you know, wanted to to, to reckon with with Du Bois's um, archive and and take full advantage of it for the for this project. Um, that's that's wonderful. I, I I was thinking when you were talking about um, you know how expansive um, his thinking was and how much it changed over time, and you're talking about him you know returning to Europe and being in Germany in the 1930s and how that yeah. changed his perspective. And then I was you know thinking of him in Germany in the, in the 1880s, and I mean just yeah, I mean, yeah. just what a what an intellectual journey in addition to the pragmatic <laughs> practical Absolutely. journey that he that he was on yeah 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 it's just a, a remarkable life you know, 95 years um born in great barrington 1868 during reconstruction and dies on the eve of the march on washington in 1963 so it's a remarkable journey um well um one Last just a little question. Someone wants to know how many pages is the book? <laughs> <laughs> uh, du Bois's book or, or my book? <laughs> well, I both maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I wrote a, a a big long book. I mean, my my book is uh, you know, roughly about four hundred pages or so. Um, that's not including the, the end notes. There's there's a lot of notes. They're fun to go go through for us historians, but. I'll, uh, do you have an advanced copy there in your hand? Is that what you reach? I do, yeah. So this Can is, this is uh, <laughs> the advanced copy. This is this is how it looks. Um, but yeah, I just really kind of found myself immersed in the story, and as I kept you know researching and writing, you know, realized just how expansive the, the story itself was, and how in order to really do justice to it, um, you know, I had to 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 really begin you know during World War One and and take it all the way up to to World War Two in its aftermath. Because that's really uh, the the span of time Du Bois is reckoning with the the history and and legacy of World War One, um, and the the amount of time that he was actually you know spending trying to write this incredible book, which he he never finished. Um, you know, which as I said, he envisioned at one point being a possible sequel to to Black Reconstruction. Um, you know, it would have been I think one of his most important works of of history. Um, wonderful. Um, that's a wonderful note to end on. Um, we can't thank you enough, Chad, for this beautiful talk and for the book that we are looking forward to um, holding in our hands. Um, I will just say, um, oh, I think Zoe put it in the in the um, in the chat that um, uh, to everyone, um, tomorrow is Du Bois's birthday. As we mentioned, um, uh, um, Chad is also delivering the the annual Du Bois lecture on this on the same topic tomorrow night at uh, UMass Amherst. Um, also, you may give a gift in honor of Du Bois's birthday tomorrow if you wish. That link is in the chat. And um, last but not least, um, as I mentioned, uh, Chad Williams was one of our inaugural um, scholar writer participants in the Du Bois Forum last summer, um, which had a public event at Jacob's Pillow. We'll be doing um, a version of that again this year. This will be the second annual. Um, um, and the public event will also be at Jacob's Pillow on Friday, July 7th. Um, so if you are in the area or not and would like to be, uh, mark your calendars for that. Um, Chad will be there and um, several dozen other scholars, writers, and artists whose work um, intersects in various ways with Du Bois and the Black intellectual and artistic traditions in which he um, was so central. Um, we will also, Chad, I didn't get to tell you this, have your book available there. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and that will be, um, I think, available at uh, Jacob's Pillow all summer, in fact. Um, and uh, and especially on that day, uh, July 7, um, you may go ahead and pre-order your book, however, if you're with us today, Please do. Please do. Um, through any of the usual links, um, your local bookseller, um, Amazon, everything in between. Um, please join me in, in thanking Chad Williams for this wonderful talk, and we look forward to seeing you um, at our next event. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you again, Kendra. Appreciate it.